Chapter 1 In what year was the 14th Amendment to the Constitution ratified? Could have called on anybody. There were 22 other kids in the classroom, and they all had their hands in the air. Francis did. Teddy did. Gina did, of course. Even Nick Blonsky, who usually sits in the back row with his pencil up his nose, had his hand raised. She could have called on one of them, right? Guess who she calls on? Nate! Yep! Mrs. Godfrey always does this. She always calls on me when I don't know the answer. And she can tell I don't know it. Ever hear somebody say that dogs can smell fear? That's Mrs. Godfrey. She's like a dog. A big, ugly, nasty dog. I sort of scooch down in my seat. The whole class is staring at me. My ears start to burn. Then my cheeks. I can feel tiny droplets of sweat beating up on my forehead. Well, she barks. Um, <clears throat> what was the question again? I've heard that on an average day you use about 10% of your brain power. Well, sitting here with my mouth turning as dry as a sack of sand, I really need that other 90% to kick in. But my mind is blank. Mrs. Godfrey steps away from the chalkboard and starts toward me. She looks mad. No, worse than mad. She looks mean. Her face is flushed. I can see tiny flecks of spittle at the corners of her mouth. That's pretty gross. I brace myself. And then the bell rings and rings and keeps on ringing. Except it doesn't really sound like the school bell. It sounds more like... Ring! Whap! I was dreaming. I blink hard, then let out a huge sigh of relief. I've never been so happy to hear that alarm clock in my entire life. Not that I'm ready to get up or anything. Closing my eyes again, I flop back down onto my pillow. Time to go to school. Nab! Poof! Hey, thanks a lot, Dad. Way to break it to me gently. Nice parenting. Actually, his parenting skills aren't that bad. He makes the nastiest tuna casserole you've ever tasted. But he's pretty harmless, especially compared to some of the psycho dads I've seen at Little League games. It's just that that's kind of clueless. He has no idea what it's like to be me. Parental fact. Once you go bald, you completely lose your ability to relate to anyone under the age of 30. I mean, how long has it been since he was in middle school? 30 or 40 years? I think he's forgotten how it feels to be held prisoner all day long in a building that smells like a combination of chalk dust, ammonia, and mystery meat. He can't remember what it's like to be an average sixth grader. Not that I'm an average sixth grader. Okay, I'll admit that I'm not exactly Joe Honor Roll, but answer me this. When I get out there in the real world, is anybody going to care whether or not I know who was vice president under Warren G. Harding? And don't try to pretend that you know who it was because you don't. The point is, I want to use my talents for more than just memorizing useless facts. I'm meant for bigger things. I am destined for greatness. I'm still not 100% sure what kind of greatness I'm destined for. But I'll figure it out. I've got options. I keep a list on my closet door about this very subject. Could achieve greatness in... 1. Soccer. I'm the goalie for our middle school team. 2. Music. Enslave the Mollusk, the band I started with Francis, Teddy, and Arthur. Rocks! 3. Cartooning. I specialize in caricatures of teachers. Four, table football. I am awesome at it, but it might be a tough way to make a living. There's also stuff I definitely won't achieve greatness in, like opera, synchronized swimming, and cat grooming. Enough said.
Let's get back to the unfortunate fact that today's a school day. But what kind? You know, not all school days are created equal. You can rank them by category. Just so you know, I'm really into ranking stuff. One time, I spent a solid week ranking every kind of snack food I could think of. At the top, cheese doodles. At the bottom, rice cakes. Dad fact. Dad handed out rice cakes for Halloween one year. That was also the year our house got egged. Connect the dots, Dad. Here you go, kids. What the? If I were to grade the different kinds of school days report card style, here's how they'd stack up. A plus. Field trip days. I'm not talking about lame field trips when a teacher makes you walk around the neighborhood on Earth Day picking up trash. I'm talking about an all-day get on a bus and go somewhere field trip. Even if they give you a worksheet in the hope that you might actually learn something, you can usually come up with an excuse not to do it. That's what I did last year when we went to the aquarium. Ah, uh, walrus ate my homework. B. Special events day. This is when classroom time gets eaten up by something better, like a movie or an assembly, or better yet, some sort of emergency. Last spring, Mrs. Cherwicky's wig caught on fire and set off the smoke alarm in the faculty lounge. We got to evacuate the building and ended up playing ultimate frisbee on the lawn for an hour. That was awesome for everybody except Mrs. Cherwicky. I should be in math right now. C minus substitute teacher days. I think we can all agree that subs are almost always better than the real teachers. By better, I mean more clueless. The absolute best subs are the fresh out of college ones who have never taught a day in their lives. Frankly, they're not very bright, or maybe they're just really gullible. You know, the word gullible isn't in the dictionary. It's not. But Mr. Galvin always lets us chew gum in class. Okay, carry on. D. Normal days. Unfortunately, most days are like this. You spend six and a half action-packed hours studying subjects like photosynthesis in the War of 1812. Thrilling. You get home after school and your parents are like, "What did you learn in school today?" And you think about it for a solid ten seconds and then you say, "I don't have the foggiest idea." F. Train wrecks. There are so many ways for a school day to go wrong that it's almost impossible to list them all. You could get screamed at by a teacher, usually Mrs. Godfrey, for absolutely no reason, which seems to happen to me a lot. You can get roughed up by Chester, the school bully who looks like he spikes his chocolate milk with human growth hormone, or your teacher could nail you with a quiz or a test you never saw coming. Test. Goop. Test. Now there's a horrifying thought. Do we have a test today? I don't remember any teacher mentioning a test yesterday, but like I already told you, I don't remember much of anything they say. I usually start to lose interest right around the time I hear, "Settle down, class." Settle down, class. In teacher speak, means let the mind-numbing boredom begin. Yak 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 yak. By the way, there's a test tomorrow. Yak 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 yak. At times like this, I wish I paid better attention in class, like Francis. Francis, he'll know whether or not we have a test today. Here's the thing about Francis: he knows just about everything. He's always got his nose buried in the book of facts, and he takes school pretty seriously. The truth is, he's kind of a geek, but I'm allowed to call him that because we're tight. We've known each other since the first day of kindergarten, when he started snoring during nap time. So I hit him in the head with my Thomas the Tank engine lunchbox, and we've been best friends ever since. Francis fact: He insists on eating his lunch every day in alphabetical order: apple, celery, sandwich, yogurt. Let me see if he's up yet. Yup.
He's up. And he's reading, of course. But wait a minute. Look what he's reading. His social studies textbook. So we must have a test today. Oh, no! This is bad. This is very bad. First, because my social studies textbook is in my locker at school. And second, because I'm suddenly remembering what Mrs. Godfrey said to me after our last test. If you do this poorly on the next test, Nate, you could very well end up in summer school. D plus. Yipe. We've got social studies first period. That only gives me about 45 minutes to study my class notes. Class notes, class notes. Where are my class notes? Ah, here they are. Uh-oh. Huh. Well, it looks like my class notes aren't going to be much help. Not unless Mrs. Godfrey gives us extra credit for doodling. I'm dead. R.I.P. Nate. Right. Chapter 2 Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Have you ever noticed that's what people always say right before they stick a bowl of lumpy oatmeal in your face? Eat hearty! Please let those lumps be raisins. Now Dad's rambling on about how a high-fiber diet changed his life, but I'm barely listening. I'm still freaked out about this social studies test that could land me in summer school. Summer. School. Talk about two words that don't go together. Sort of like oat and meal. Actually, I have no idea what summer school is even like. Francis thinks it's probably just like regular school, only hotter. Public school 38. Today's temperature? 97 degrees. But other kids say that in summer school, the teachers make you work. And they're not talking about worksheets or chapter reviews. It's more like scraping gum off desks or scrubbing the toilets in the boys' locker room. Which I hope isn't true, because those toilets are totally disgusting. It sounds pretty bad. And after this, my car needs washing. The only kid I know who's ever gone to summer school is Chester. I guess I could ask him what it's like. Except the last time I tried to ask Chester something, he stuffed me into a garbage can. He's kind of a psycho. All I asked was, can I borrow a pencil? Whatever. The point is, summer school can't be good. I can't think of anything nastier. Suddenly, right on cue, in walks Ellen. Good morning, Daddy. Mwah! Yummy oatmeal! Okay, I can think of something. Some one nastier. Summer school only lasts eight weeks. A 15-year-old sister is forever. Until she turns 16, which is probably even worse. You're in my seat. Flick! Sisters don't have to be teenagers to be obnoxious, though. They're pretty much born that way. If you have an older sister, you know exactly what I mean. You've been there. You feel my pain. If you don't have an older sister, congratulations, and welcome to my nightmare. Ellen Fact. Every few months, she decides she doesn't like the way she laughs, so she changes it. Ha ha ha! No, that's not right. Top five most annoying things about Ellen. Five. She is constantly begging Dad to buy her a cat. We'll name her Miss Kissykins. Four. She wears perfume that makes her smell like a gift shop full of scented candles. This one's called Dead Skunk. Three. She got a karaoke machine for her twelfth birthday, and she still hasn't outgrown it. Love is the answer. Kill me now. Two, all her hair care products are single-handedly destroying the ozone layer. Who cares about global warming? <laughs> One, nobody except me realizes how completely obnoxious she is. Clueless grown-up. Ellen, you're wonderful.
Yes, I know. You want to know what else is annoying about Ellen? She doesn't have these types of problems. She's never had to worry about summer school because she's always been a good student, which I get reminded of practically every day. Why can't you be more like your sister? Right. Like that's my goal in life. To be more like a high school cheerleader. Thanks, but no thanks. Huh? Oh, Dad's talking again. So, what's happening at school today, you two? <gasps> We're getting back our book reports, which I know I did well on. And I'm trying out for the school musical. And I'm running for class president. And then I'm going to work. Note to self. Ed, you can't shut her up to list of annoying things about Ellen. Nate, what's going on for you? Who? Me? Uh, nothing. Not a thing. It's just a normal day. No tests or anything like that. Nothing unusual. Hmm. Don't think Dad really bought that. He's giving me the look. The look. Level one on Dad's suspicion meter. It means he's not really sure you're being straight with him. The squint. Level two is basically Dad's way of saying, you can't possibly be serious. The hairy eyeball. Level three. When Dad drops a hairy eyeball on you, look out. Prepare for him to go ballistic. Dad's only at level one right now, but I can see where this is going. So I'd better get out of here before he asks any more questions. Zoom! Whew, that was close. He has no idea I could end up in summer school. Not unless he and Mrs. Godfrey are having secret late-night phone conversations. Ew, time to think about something else. Trip! Wham! Wag, 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 wag! Nice spot for a nap, Spitzy. Shouldn't you be off chasing squirrels or something? Spitzy belongs to Mr. Eustace, who lives next door. And in case the doofy-looking dog sweater and giant funnel on his head didn't tip you off, Spitzy is the ultimate dog nerd. He's afraid of mailmen. He eats his own poop. And don't try throwing him a tennis ball. I did that once, and we ended up at the animal hospital getting his stomach pumped. It's a long story. But I don't want to rag on Spitzy. Spitzy's okay. After all, he's a dog, and all dogs are cool in my book. Except maybe those freaky little hairless chihuahuas. Spitzy fact. He has a crush on Francis's cat, Pickles. It must be nice to be you, Spitzy. You get to hang out all day, sleeping in the sun. You don't have to worry about hairy eyeballs, or big sisters, or teachers. And you especially don't have to worry about taking a social studies test. Wait! A minute! Maybe I don't have to worry about the test either. What if I can get out of it? What if I can convince Mrs. Godfrey to let me take the test tomorrow instead of today? Then I'll borrow Francis's class notes and cram for 24 hours. That'll at least give me a chance to pass the stupid thing. How does that sound, Spitzy? Oof! You'll help me think of something, right? Oof! See, that's why dogs are so much better than cats. Cats never help you do anything. They just lie around the house, scratching up the furniture and licking themselves. Okay, brainstorm time. How can I get out of this test? Think, 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 think. It's easy coming up with a plan. The problem is, almost as soon as I do come up with a plan, I think of a reason it won't work. Plan A. Illness. As soon as the test starts, I hold my breath until my face turns all red. Then I tell Mrs. Godfrey I feel really, really sick. Why it won't work. She keeps a thermometer in her desk. Just as I thought. 98.6. Plan B. Injury. I wrap my hand in bandages, then tell her I can't write because I sprained my wrist why it won't work. She'll make me take the test left-handed. Yep, she's that mean. What? He didn't hurt his wrist? Very interesting. Plan C. Tragic accident. I pretend to hit my head against the door on my way into the classroom, then act like I've got amnesia. 
My, my mind has gone blank. Again? Why it won't work? I used that one two weeks ago. Plan D. The truth. I walk right up to Mrs. Godfrey, look her in the eye, and tell her that I didn't know there was a test today. Why it won't work? The woman hates me. <laughs> Shoot! This is getting me nowhere. I've only got 25 minutes until the test. 25 minutes until Mrs. Godfrey brings down the summer school hammer on me. School zone. No fun allowed. I glance at my watch. Now it's 24 minutes. Yikes. It's beginning to look like the only way I'll be able to avoid this test is... Is... Is to skip school altogether. Chapter 3 Yes! That's it! I'll skip school! I'll take the day off! I'll pretend somebody just invented a new holiday! I'll... I'll... I'll stop right here. What am I doing? Nobody gets away with skipping school at PS 38. It's impossible. Why? Two words. The machine. Not a real machine, like that funky-looking thing the janitor uses to buff up the floors. The machine isn't something you can see or touch, but it's there. The machine watches you. It knows your every move. And if you're not where you're supposed to be, the machine tracks you down. Here's how. 1. The seating chart. Teachers always tell you where to sit. They claim it helps them remember kids' names. Right, like they care what our names are. They really do it to keep tabs on you. One look at the chart, and they know right away if you're not at your desk. Then, the machine starts up. 2. The attendance sheet. Teachers write everything down. Who knows why? We're organized. You're control freaks. They fill out an attendance sheet in every class. If you're missing, a big red X goes next to your name. Congratulations, you're absent. 3. The Classroom Helper We saw a movie about bees in science. The big fat queen bee sat around the hive doing nothing while the little drones did all the work. Sound familiar? Peel me a grape. Teachers are the queen bees. Guess who the drones are? I'm looking for a classroom helper to do a very important job. Oh! It's always a suck-up like Gina who volunteers because she's so desperate to earn extra credit. Good for you, Gina. I'm sure your career as a sixth grade classroom helper will get you into some fancy pants college. Take this attendance sheet to the front office. The front office. The engine that runs the machine. And right in the middle of it is... 4. The school secretary. Mrs. Shapulsky is not so bad. It isn't her fault they make her keep track of attendance. I also don't blame her for all the time she says, Nate, the principal will see you now. She's fast for an old lady. She looks over all those attendance sheets in no time. The second she spots that red X next to your name, she's on the phone to your parents. Nate isn't at school. What? There. You see how the machine works? See how efficient it is? You can't win. There's no way to beat it. That's my predicament. If I run off to the woods to hang out with Spitzy, it'll take about five minutes for Mrs. Shapolsky to fire up the dad hotline. Then, summer school would be the least of my problems. I'd probably get suspended. Or expelled. Maybe shipped to some military academy where they slap a uniform on you, give you a buzz cut, and make you say sir at the end of every sentence. Bzzz. That settles it. Skipping school is out. I need to be a little more creative about this. What I need is an excused absence. An excused absence means you go to school just like normal. 
But you've got a parent note saying that you need to be somewhere else at a certain time. Bingo! You're free. Yesterday, Alan Olquist left halfway through science because he had to go get a wart zapped. How lucky can you get? So long, suckers! Smell you later! So all I need to do is stroll into social studies with a note from Dad saying I've got an excuse. Let's say a dentist appointment. And I'm off the hook. Genius! Yeah, yeah, I know what you're thinking. I don't have a note from Dad. But I can take care of that. Dear Mrs. Godfrey, Please excuse Nate from social studies at 8.45 this morning. He has a very important dentist app. Whoa. Nope, that won't cut it. That looks too much like my handwriting. Mrs. Godfrey will sniff that out right away. She may be loud and nasty, but the woman's not stupid. I've got to make it look more like a grown-up's handwriting. Like Dad's. And his is wicked messy. Whoops. Not that messy. Even I can't read that. This is tougher than I thought it would be. And I'm running out of time. Dear Mrs. Godfrey, Please excuse Nate from social studies at 8.45 this morning. He has a very important dentist appointment. Hey, hey, that looks like the real thing. Pretty convincing. Hello, excused absence. Goodbye, social studies test. All that's left to do is forge Dad's signature. Forge Dad's signature. Uh, let me think about this for a sec. Forge. Forgery. Yikes! Isn't forgery, like, a crime? Don't people get thrown in jail for signing the wrong name on a check or for using somebody else's credit card? Listen, I'm no goody two-shoes. There's a desk in the detention room with my name on it. Literally. But I'm not breaking the law. I don't want to get dragged out of PS38 in handcuffs. There goes the notorious Nate Wright. The identity thief? Yowza! This might not be such a great idea. Maybe I should just rip this thing up before somebody comes along and... Hey! Gah! Oh, man. It's only Francis. That's the downside of living next door to your best friend. He's always sneaking up behind you and invading your privacy. Not that I have anything to hide. What are you writing? Nothing. Nothing. Okay, so I've got one tiny little thing to hide. Nothing? He asks. Nothing. I shoot back. It doesn't look like nothing. Why is he acting all Sherlock Holmes on me? It looks like a letter. Okay, okay, I'll tell you. I was forging an excuse note to get out of today's social studies test. Hmm. Long, awkward pause. Francis has a weird expression on his face. One of those half-smiling, half-confused looks. He's either judging me for what I just told him, or he's about to fart. What social studies test? He says. Francis can be such a moron. I've got to remind myself sometimes how smart he is. The test I saw you studying for this morning. I wasn't studying for a test, he says. Then why were you reading your social studies textbook? Because I enjoy improving my mind. I'm going to ignore the incredibly lame statement Francis just made and focus on what he said right before that. So, there's no social studies test? There's definitely not a test. I should know because I write down everything she says. If we have a test, I would have known when I was reviewing my notes. Blah, 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 blah. Yes! 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 Actually, Francis says, his eyes getting all dreamy. I sort of wish we were having a test today. Mrs. Godfrey's essay questions are so invigorating. Biff! Sorry, Francis, but when you start acting like the mayor of Geek City, it's my job to knock some sense into you. You're lucky I didn't nail you with a heavier book. Bring! There's the first bell. Not exactly music to my ears, but that sick feeling in the pit of my stomach is gone. No test.
No summer school. This could end up being a half decent day after all. Hum de hum de hum de dum de dum. Shoo tong. Got you back. Yep. Things are definitely looking up. Chapter four. Hey Nate, taking a nap? Or are you doing the world's slowest push-up? That's Teddy. Just ignore his lame jokes. I always do. Teddy's my other best friend. Francis is number one because I've known him longer. But Teddy is definitely one A. He's awesome. Teddy fact. He taught me how to say Mrs. Godfrey is fat in Spanish. Senora Godfrey es grasa. Si. I wasn't so sure about him at first. That's the way it is with new kids. You sort of check them out from a distance to see if they seem cool or not. You don't want to be all Joe friendly to them right away because what if they turn out to be total losers? Random new kid. Would you like to see my nasal spray collection? Me. Okay. What am I saying? With Teddy, it was tough to tell. On his first day at PS thirty eight, Principal Nichols asked me to show him around the school. Teddy was all quiet and serious. He barely said a word the whole day. I've told Teddy plenty of times since then that he seemed like a total dork. Can this kid even talk? Then he and I were paired up for a science lab. We were supposed to dissect a squid. We were about five minutes into it when Teddy picked up our squid and pretended it was a giant booger. Anybody got a tissue? It was hilarious. I started laughing, and then Teddy cracked up too. That was the first time I'd ever heard him laugh. He sounded like some sort of crazed llama. <laughs> Oh man, we lost it! We were laughing so hard that we dropped our squid on the floor. Then Mary Ellen Popowski stepped on it, which made us laugh even harder. Ew! <laughs> That's when Mr. Galvin saw what was going on. Wow, was he mad? He went full Godfrey on us. Glossary. When a teacher completely snaps and starts screaming, it's called a full Godfrey. When Mrs. Godfrey does it, it's called Monday. He made us clean the squid guts off the floor. We apologized to Mary Ellen, but I guess we didn't sound sorry enough because she kept whining that her shoe smelled like dead squid. I said maybe that was an improvement over how they smelled before. Then I had to apologize to Mary Ellen again. We had detention for two whole weeks. You get in trouble that bad with somebody, and it changes the way you think about him. When I saw Teddy dangling that squid from his nose, I figured he was okay. And after we did all those detentions together, I knew we were going to be friends for life. Race you guys to the flagpole, but that doesn't mean I'm going to let him beat me to the flagpole. Ha! My turbo speed is taking over. I'm gonna win this race by a mile. Wham! Holy cow! Principal Nichols. This could get ugly. Principal Nichols is Mister Discipline. He doesn't stand for any horsing around. And here I am, body slamming him on his way into the building. Stand back. He's about to explode. I'm sorry, Nate. I wasn't looking where I was going. That was entirely my fault. Like I was saying, Principal Nichols, what a great guy! Are you all right? He asks. Yeah, it didn't hurt. I tell him, you're sort of like a giant airbag. Uh, that is, you're kind of cushiony. I mean, it's not like you're all bony and stuff. What I'm trying to say, I'll just stop talking now. Move along, son," says Principal Nichols, looking like "son" is the last thing he wants to call me. Whew! Sure, I'll be happy to move along. I thought he was going to hit me with a detention for sure. Come on, guys," says Francis. Only a couple of minutes till homeroom. 
Hang on, I've got to put away my lunch. Click. <laughs> I have sort of an organization problem. One of these days, I really need to clean out my locker. With a dump truck. Or maybe a match. But no time for that now. Let's see here. Where's my lunch? It's not here. You've got to be kidding me. I ran out of the house so fast this morning I forgot to stick my lunch in my backpack. I groan. No problem, Teddy tells me. I've got you covered. You do? I ask. Yep, he says. We went out for Chinese food last night. I've got a ton of leftovers. Sesame chicken, spare ribs, a couple of egg rolls. Here, have a fortune cookie. Hmm, a fortune cookie. I like getting my fortune told. I'm way into horoscopes and magic eight balls and stuff like that. By the way, I'm a Scorpio. That means I'm dynamic, loyal, and chock full of animal magnetism. In other words, I rock. What's your sign? But fortune cookies bug me sometimes. Fortune telling means predicting the future, right? But half the time, fortune cookies don't tell you anything about the future. They're just lame sayings. Sometimes they're boring. A large life is a series of small events. Sometimes they're stupid. Hair today, gone tomorrow. Plus, the cookies taste like styrofoam. Sometimes, like that time Dad took me and Ellen to Poo Poo Panda, they make absolutely no sense. That one was so bizarre, I drew a comic about it. Here, kids, fortune cookies. Ooh, mine says your wish will be granted. Ooh, and mine says, what the? An unlit candle frightens no monkeys. What does that mean? Who cares? The important thing is my fortune was good. We may never find out what it means, Nate. And we never did. What a ripoff! I guess you could say I've got a love-hate relationship with fortune cookies. I hardly ever get a good one, but I still can't resist cracking them open. Wow! Now that's what I call a fortune. Today, you will surpass all others. Chapter Five. I'm in an awesome mood when I walk into homeroom. Not because of homeroom. Only a total geek would get all pumped up about that. Homeroom is my favorite part of the day. See, it's my fortune that's great. It looked like today was gonna stink out loud, and now everything's completely turned around. What are you so happy about? Francis asks. I just got some amazing news. I tell him. Have you ever heard me say I'm destined for greatness? You may have mentioned it once or twice, or a zillion times. He says, rolling his eyes. Well, this proves it. I say, handing him the fortune. Francis reads it. He's making his constipated. I'm not so sure about this face. Hmm. Surpass all others, he says. Surpass them in what? I'm a man of many talents. I tell him it could be anything. Francis hands me back the fortune. Not anything, he says with a smirk. We can eliminate academic achievement as a possibility. Thwack! You're a riot, Francis. Just for that, I might not include you in my posse when I get rich and famous. It'll be great to be rich. Then I can pay people to make my life easier. A chauffeur to drive me around. A brainiac to do all my homework. Somebody to buy all my clothes so I don't have to go to the mall and try on pants in one of those cheesy little changing rooms. I hate that. Knock knock. Don't come in. And I'll get a chef, somebody to cook me all kinds of good stuff. I'm starving right now. All I've got in my stomach is a couple of spoonfuls of lumpy oatmeal. Hmm. I guess I could eat this fortune cookie. Better than nothing. 
Miss Godfrey, Nate's eating something. Gina? Oh, how I hate her. Is this true, Nate? Mrs. Godfrey's voice cuts right through me as she heaves herself up from her chair. Uh-oh. If Mrs. Godfrey catches you eating in class, it's an automatic detention. Pretty bogus, considering she keeps a stash of peanut butter cups in her desk. Don't ask me how I know that. I have my ways. Yikes. She's moving fast. Come on, chew. Swallow. Now. Woo. Just in time. I choke down the last few crumbs half a second before she steams up to my desk. Open your mouth. Ah. Uh... Hmm, she says, looking long and hard. I don't see anything. You must have been mistaken, Gina. Tough toenails, Gina. What? Ha! Gina's speechless. Her little plan to land me in trouble didn't work. How sweet is that? Attention, please, for this morning's announcements. Oh, boy. Announcements. The excitement never stops around here. Students interested in joining the math team should see Mr. Staples. Yeah, because I just don't have enough math in my life. Today's lunch is beef stew, green beans, cornbread, and fruit cup. And all four of them taste exactly alike. If you visit the library today, wish Mrs. Hickson a happy birthday. She's 39. In dog years... Thank you, and have a great day. That's it. Homeroom's over. So, why am I still sitting here? Because homeroom with Mrs. Godfrey is followed by first period social studies with... Mrs. Godfrey! What a brutal way to start the day. Now I know where the phrase rude awakening comes from. After social studies, there's nowhere to go but up. Here's the rest of my day. Period 2. English. Ms. Clark is okay, but shouldn't someone who teaches English actually make sense once in a while? For a non-restrictive clause or phrase, but not for independent clauses joined by coordinating conjunctions... Say what? Period 3. Art. This is my favorite class. Mr. Rosa is so burned out, he doesn't even bother with lesson plans. Now that's teaching. Here's some clay. Have fun. Period four. Lunch. You eat as quick as you can. Then you spend the rest of the time checking out girls and throwing carrot sticks at Brad Macklin. Stop it, you ruffians! Bonk! Period five. Gym. When you're playing floor hockey or dodgeball, it's awesome. When you're doing rhythmic gymnastics... You pray that nobody's around taking yearbook pictures. Period 6. Math. Here's a multiple choice question. Is math A. Totally boring, B. Completely useless, C. A great place to grab an afternoon nap, D. All of the above? The correct answer is, of course, D, which was also my grade on the last test. Period 7. Science. The highlight of the year was when Mr. Galvin's dentures fell out during his lecture on earthquakes. That's when I gave him the nickname, Shifting Plates. I give all the teachers nicknames. I know everybody invents funny names for teachers. But I work at it. That's why I'm the official nickname czar of PS38. A good nickname has a lot of stuff going on. One of my all-time best nicknames for Mrs. Godfrey is Venus de Silo. I got the idea from a famous sculpture called Venus de Milo. Venus was the goddess of love and beauty. Mrs. Godfrey isn't loving or beautiful. So that makes it funny. Venus is also the name of a planet. Mrs. Godfrey is a lot like a planet. She's huge, round, and gassy. <laughs> A silo is filled with feed for cows. Mrs. Godfrey reminds everyone of a cow, especially when she's eating. Moo! 
And that's only one of her nicknames. I've got tons more. In fact, I can tell you exactly how many. As soon as I check my list. Godfrey nicknames. One, Godzilla. Two, Boring.com. Three, Pass the Gravy. Four, She Who Must Not Be Named. Five, Dragon Breath. Six, I can't believe she's not butter. Seven, dark side of the moon. Eight, extra crispy. Nine, there's no place like homework. Ten, ozone. Eleven, Queen Kong. Twelve, gas station. Thirteen, Big Bang. Fourteen, Animal Planet. Fifteen, Wrecking Ball. Sixteen, Dull A Palooza. Seventeen, El Guapo. Eighteen, Pardon My Nachos. Nineteen, Jaws. Twenty, Venus De Silo. Twenty nicknames and counting. Not too shabby. Ahem. <clears throat> I'll take that. Nip. Yikes. Busted. She looks at the list for a long time. Her face turns red, then white. I can see her jaw muscles working. I wait for her to start shouting, but for the longest time she doesn't say a word. She just looks at me. That's worse than shouting. Finally, she speaks. Very impressive. She crumples up my list. Then she opens her desk drawer and pulls out a pad. I've seen that pad before. She writes something down, then hands me the slip. I notice a tiny smile at the corners of her mouth, but the rest of her looks mean. Take this to Mrs. Zerwicky at the end of the day, she tells me. Detention report. Student, Nate Wright. Teacher, C. Godfrey. Reason for detention? Insolence. Insolence, I say out loud. What's that? Here's a dictionary, Mrs. Godfrey snarls. Look it up. Whoop. <sighs> flip, 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 flip. I bet it doesn't mean destined for greatness. Chapter Six. Insolence. Noun. One, contemptuously rude or impertinent behavior or speech. Two, the quality or condition of being insolent. Turns out insolence basically means acting like a brat. I say to Francis and Teddy as we walk to English. That sounds like you. I'm just about to give Teddy a notebook smackdown when I remember that he's going to share his lunch with me later. I decide to be nice to him. Shut up, scrub. I stuff Mrs. Godfrey's detention slip deep into my pocket. I'm not going to let one little detention ruin my whole day, especially not after I got such an awesome fortune. What do you guys think "you will surpass all others" means? I ask. Probably that you got somebody else's fortune cookie by mistake. Teddy laughs. What is this? Make fun of Nate Day? <laughs> Hold it. Hold it! It doesn't just say you will surpass all others. Francis corrects me. It says today you will surpass all others. Hmm, he's right. So the fortune will probably come true during school. At home, the only others for me to surpass are. And then Cindy told me she thought Tommy liked me, but then she came in Tommy. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Dad and Ellen, big whoop. So, if the fortune is real, I say, I'm going to surpass all others sometime in the next six hours. I guess so. Francis shrugs. You'd better work fast. Hi, Jenny. Hey, Arthur. Hi. Hello, peoples. Ugh, Jenny and Arthur. Excuse me while I gag. What does she see in that guy? 
besides the fact that he's funny, he's nice, and everybody likes him? Thanks, Francis. Feel free to stop talking any time. And by the way, not everybody likes him. I'm not exactly president of the Artur fan club. It's not like he's a major butthead or anything. I just hate that he's so good at stuff. All the stuff I'm good at. It's so obnoxious. Artur fact. He doesn't speak English all that great, which for some reason all the girls think is cute. Seeing you later. <laughs> He's so adorable. Things were a lot better before Artur came along. Before Artur, I was the number one player on the chess team. Checkmate. Stunned expression. After Artur, he knocked me down to number two. Nice tries, Nate. <sighs> B A. My comic strip was the only one in the school newspaper. Doctor Cesspool by Nate. A A. Now I have to share space with Artur's strip. Fish breath. Burp. Which is totally copied from Garfield. B A. I was the lead singer in Enslave the Mollusk. Who's ready to rock? A A. Guess what happened? Ooh, your sweet, sweet love. Cheesy ballad. So everybody thinks our tour is Mr. Wonderful. I can deal with that. But when he and Jenny started going out, that killed me. Jenny fact. She and our tour have been going out for four months, six days, and three and a half hours. But who's counting? I met Jenny in first grade. I've liked her ever since, and I'm positive that deep down she likes me too, even though she acts like she hates me. I've always been one hundred percent sure that someday the two of us are going to make an awesome couple. Then our tour comes along. The next thing you know, they're acting like Romeo and Juliet all over the place. It's gross. It's sickening. It's, it's, whoa. The fortune. Today you will surpass all others. Could that have something to do with Jenny? Maybe the fortune means I'm going to surpass our tour. Maybe Jenny dumps him, and starts going out with me. Attention, everyone. Today we'll be finishing up our poetry unit. Miss Clark announces. I used to think poetry was just a bunch of British dudes wearing tights and writing sonnets with a peacock feather, but there's a lot more to it. Miss Clark has taught us about all kinds of poetry. We have to write our own poems in a poetry portfolio. Poetry portfolio. Nate Wright. Nate Great. Date Fate. Late Mate Rate State. Duh. What rhymes with duh? Doodle, oodle, noodle, strudel, poodle, caboodle. Limerick, by Nate Wright. I have feasted on all sorts of noodles. I have tried an assortment of strudels. Of the foods that I've eaten, only one can't be beaten: an extra large bag of cheese doodles. Haiku, by Nate Wright. You have cheese doodles, fresh, crunchy, puffalicious. Give me one right now. Ode to a cheese doodle by Nate Wright. I search the grocery store in haste to find that sweet lip-smacking taste, and there it is in aisle nine. It's just a dollar thirty-nine. A bag of doodles most delicious. Check the label; they're nutritious. And do you know how satisfied I feel while munching doodles fried? I savor each bright orange curl until it seems I just might hurl. Their praises I will always sing. Cheese doodles are my everything. Miss Clark is still yakking away. You may write any kind of poem you like, she says.
A funny poem, a serious poem, a love poem. But let's avoid any more poems about junk food, shall we? Junk food? Excuse me, but cheese doodles are not junk food. They're Y U M M Y. Hold it. Did Miss Clark say love poem? A love poem. That just might work. Jenny goes wild for that sort of thing. She was all excited about a Valentine Artur gave her last year, and that was only a lame store-bought card. I look across the room at Jenny. She's busy picking lint balls off her sweater, but there's electricity between us. I can feel it. A plan is forming in my brain. Step one: I write a love poem to Jenny, but not a sappy, mushy one. One that says, "Why hang out with Artur when I'm available?" Step two: I slip the poem into Jenny's notebook when Artur's not stuck to her like Joe Velcro. Step three: I sit back and wait for Jenny to fall madly in love with me. You're irresistible. Why didn't I see it before? I've never written a love poem before, but how tough can it be? All I've got to do is find a few words that rhyme with Jenny. Many, Jenny, Penny, Annie. Ooh! Hey, Jenny! Looks like Nate's writing you a love poem. Gina, why can't she mind her own stinking business? I can feel my face turning beet red. I sneak a quick peek at the other side of the room. Jenny's looking at me funny. So is our tour. Great. Leave it to Gina to ruin everything. Now my plan has exactly zero chance of working. Goodbye, love poem. Rip, 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 rip. Nate. And now here's Miss Clark. This just keeps getting better. Is there a problem? Problem? Are you having trouble thinking of something to write about besides cheese doodles? She smiles. Uh, yeah, sort of. I stammer. Poetry comes from the heart, Nate. She tells me, "That's where you'll find something to inspire you." Uh, okay. I have no idea what she means, but I nod my head anyway. The whole class is staring at me. I'm like, "Can we just move on?" Then I hear it. Nobody else does, but I do. <laughs> Gina laughs. I shoot her a look. She's leaning back in her chair. She's got a nasty little smile on her face. Here I am, looking like a fool in front of everyone, in front of Jenny, and Gina's loving every minute. She made this happen. This is her fault. The blood is pounding in my head. Miss Clark is saying something. I can barely hear her. Well, Nate, what does your heart tell you? What does my heart tell me? It tells me that Gina should keep her big fat mouth shut. Chapter Seven. So let me get this straight, Francis says as we file out of the English classroom. Gina's the one who should keep her big fat mouth shut. <laughs> well, she should. I grumble, waving the pink slip Ms. Clark just handed me. How come I get detention and Gina gets nothing? Gina never gets in trouble, says Francis matter-of-factly. She gets other people in trouble. Really? What a brilliant observation, Francis! I didn't know that. Can I see? Teddy takes the detention slip and reads out loud. Reason for detention: being disruptive in class. Insulting a classmate, Francis nods. You were pretty insulting. Are you kidding? I say that was nothing. I can be way more insulting than that. For example, I could say to Teddy, "Your mama's so fat when she gets on an elevator, she has to go down." <laughs> Your mama's so hairy, she shaves her forehead. <laughs> It's about to turn into a no holds barred yo mama throwdown when Francis interrupts us. Dudes, he says, pointing excitedly. 
Check it out! I looked down the hall. Check what out? Luke Bertrand and Amy Wexler are in a major lip lock. Matt Grover is giving Peter Hinkle a turbo wedgie. Yank! And that weird girl whose name I can never remember is writing all over her arms again. Unicorns are beautiful. Boys are smelly. In other words, everything looks normal. What are we supposed to look at? I ask Francis. Duh, the display case, he says. PS38 has two display cases. The one outside Principal Nichols' office is filled with all sorts of dusty trophies, boring spelling bee ribbons, and ancient pictures of the basketball team. What's up with the uniforms? It looks like they're wearing underwear. But the other display case is cool. It's where Mr. Rosa puts all the best student artwork. He always chooses one student to feature on the center panel. There's a banner along the top that says, Spotlight on? If you've got the spotlight, it's like Mr. Rose is telling everyone, This is the best artist in the school. Mwah! Hey, that could be it. If something by me is in the spotlight, that means the fortune was right. I'll surpass all others. I rush up to the display case. I bet my penguin sculpture is there. Nope, it's just drawings. Yeah, lame drawings. Time for some feedback from Nate Wright, art critic. Still Life by Ken. Nice try, Ken, but you should probably stick to Woodshop. Prancing Ponies by Amanda. Sorry to burst your bubble, Amanda, but this looks like a bunch of sausages with legs. Portrait of My Hand by Tammy K. I'm not sure about that hand, Tammy, but your other hand can't draw very well. And look who's in the spotlight. Again? I blurt out. This is the second month in a row he's been on the center panel. Old Shoe by Artur. Well, you have to admit, Teddy says, pressing up against the glass. It's a pretty awesome drawing. It's okay, I sniff. Okay, Francis protests. He's just like a junior Picasso. Oh, yeah? Since when did Picasso make a career out of drawing shoes? Hey, it's the mad of the hour. Great drawing, Artur. Thanks, you were very good. Yeah, yeah, everybody loves Artur. This is so unfair. Why should he be such an art star? I've done tons of drawings that are better than that stupid shoe of his. Like this one. Lunch by Nate. Look at that! My drawing has it all! Action, suspense, potential bloodshed. This deserves to be in the spotlight just as much as our tour's drawing. Time to file an official protest. All right, class, let's... Mr. Rosa, I have a question about the display case. Nate, I don't have time for frivolous requests right now. What? Frivolous requests? Frivolous requests? What does frivolous mean? Knock it off, Nate. We're supposed to be making puppet heads. Puppet heads? I'm supposed to concentrate on puppet heads? Now? This is an outrage! I glance up at the door. The display case is only a few feet away. If Mr. Rosa won't put my drawing in that stinking case, I will. Francis has his nose buried in the puppet head instructions. How to make a puppet head. Step one, inflate balloon and tie it tightly. Step two, dip pieces of newsprint in paste. Step three, lay your newsprint over balloon, cover completely, let dry. Psst. Francis, he shoots me a suspicious glance. Why are you whispering? Shh. No questions, I hiss at him. I need a diversion. 
What kind of diversion? Any kind of diversion, I say. Just distract Mr. Rosa for five or ten seconds. That's all the time I'll need. Need for... He starts to ask, but I shush him. Mr. Rosa is wandering over. I give Francis a look that means, if you're really my best friend, you'll do this for me. He gives me a look that means, you're a moron, but hey, it's your funeral. Good old Francis. I ease over to the door. I wait for Francis to do his part. Whoops! <laughs> Perfect! The whole class cracks up, and while Mr. Rose is trying to calm everybody down, I sneak out, and presto! I'm standing in front of the display case. That was almost too easy. Now, I just have to pop open this door, and I'll stick my drawing right on top of our tours. Ha! Oh, you've got to be kidding me! It's stuck! I yank and yank, but nothing happens. Pop! Until the knob breaks off. Smash! Holy cow, that was loud. Hope nobody heard me. I'm sorry to do this, Nate, but you leave me no choice. Guess what Mr. Rosa pulls out of his back pocket. Yep, a little pink pad. Go see Mrs. Sir Wiki at the end of the day. I look at the slip he gives me. Where it says reason for detention, he didn't even write anything. He just drew a frowny face. How artistic. Chapter 8 It smells like egg salad. There aren't enough tables and the walls are the color of cat puke. But after the morning I just had, I've never been so happy to walk into the cafeteria. Sorry, cafetorium. What a stupid word. I can't believe Mr. Rosa gave you a detention, Teddy says. That's the first one he's handed out all year. You're a celebrity. Great. Oh, shoot. Chester took our table. Teddy says, and he's right. Chester sitting where I always sit, looking like the picture of Java Man in our science textbook. <laughs> well, I snicker, let's just ask him nicely to move. <laughs> right, we all know you don't ask Chester for favors, not unless you want to lose a few teeth. The kid once beat up his anger management counselor. Finding somewhere else to sit could be sort of a challenge. Let's check out a few of our options. Jock table. A great place to eat lunch, if you enjoy getting punched in the arm and or noogied. You gonna finish those chips? Scrub! Whack! Fort Knox. You can try to get in, but you have no chance. Hello, ladies. Icy stairs. Get lost! Middle Earth. A bizarre world occupied by strange and frightening creatures. Wanna play Elf Quest trivia? Huh? We decide to sit with our good friend Todd. Todd, my man! My name's Chad. Whoops! Sorry, dude. Mental note. Chubby kid with red hair and freckles is Chad, not Todd. What are you reading? Francis asks. The complete book of world records, Chad says. My ears perk up. World records. Hmm. Guys, I'm getting another one of my brilliant ideas. What do you mean another one? Francis jokes. I ignore him and pull the fortune out of my pocket. This doesn't say you will surpass your classmates at PS38, I declare. It says you will surpass all others. If I set a world record, nab, I'll surpass everyone on Earth. 
I start flipping through Chad's book. There's got to be some record I could break. I just need to find the right one. Longest fingernails? Nope. Most tattoos? Don't think so. Is there a record for goofiest hair? Asks Teddy. Shut up, I say. Ah, here we go! Speed eating! Speed eating? Says Francis, looking skeptical. Look, here's a guy who ate 60 hot dogs in 10 minutes. And this guy ate 45 slices of pizza in 10 minutes. But we don't have 45 slices of pizza. Thank you, Captain Obvious. So, what can I use to set a speed-eating record? We're racking our brains when we notice some kid's about to dump their trays. Wait! Hold it! I can't hear what Francis is saying, but a few seconds later, he's back at our table with... Green beans! Green beans? We have plenty of green beans, Francis says. Right, says Teddy, catching on. Because nobody ever eats their green beans. Suddenly, Francis and Teddy are zooming all over the lunchroom, asking everybody, Can I have your green beans? You gonna eat those green beans? Before I know it, a pile of green beans the size of Mount Everest is sitting on the table. 148 servings. Ugh. Wait, these are nasty, I say. They look slimy. Perfect, says Francis. They'll slide right down. I'm not hungry right now, I protest weakly. Let's do this tomorrow. Nope. Your fortune says you will surpass all others today. Today? Today! This world record thing is beginning to seem a lot less cool. How did I get myself into this mess? A crowd is beginning to gather. Francis sets his stopwatch. I guess there's no turning back now. Ready? Set? Go! I grab a fistful of beans and jam them into my mouth. Cold bean juice dribbles down my chin as I chew once, twice, then swallow. They taste disgusting, but they do kind of slide right down. I shovel in another mouthful. <laughs> then another. <laughs> and another. One minute down! Nine to go! One minute? I've only been eating for one minute? Oh, I don't feel so good. Eight! 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 The crowd is urging me on, but it's not working. My throat's all gaggy. I feel a little dizzy. Pieces of half-chewed beans are flying everywhere. Forget the world record. I'm hoping I don't throw up in front of half the school. Nate? Uh-oh. I know that voice. Red alert. Danger! Principal Nichols! Danger! He was all nice and friendly when I ran into him earlier today. But he's not looking friendly now. My stomach does a triple somersault. What on earth are you doing? Mm -hmm. I start to talk, but this wad of beans in my mouth is cramping my style. I try to swallow it down, but I almost choke. It's just too big. Well? There's only one thing to do. I lean over the table, and trying to be as casual as I can, I spit out the beans. <laughs> Ew! Okay, relax, people. It's not all that gross. A pile of chewed-up green beans looks about the same as a pile of unchewed-up green beans. Principal Nichols looks a little green himself. I'm just, uh, having lunch, I say. Lunch, he repeats, with the entire sixth grade cheering you on. Um, <laughs> I'm a very exciting eater. Well, I'm declaring lunch officially over. Principal Nichols growls. He looks at the green beans scattered all over the table and floor. Clean up this mess! He starts for the door, and in that half second, 
I see exactly what's about to happen. It's like it's in slow motion, but I can't do anything to stop it. Principal Nichols's foot lands in a puddle of slimy bean juice, and... Zwip! Wham! For a minute, I can't tell if he's dead or alive. Come with me to my office. Now. Lucky me. He's alive. And now I really don't feel so good. Chapter 9 Would it kill them to put a softer chair in here? This is like sitting on a toilet lid. My butt's asleep. I try to ignore the pins and needles creeping down my legs. If Principal Nichols doesn't stop yakking soon, everything below my belly button will go numb. He's lecturing me about the green beans. Yawn. I've heard this speech a zillion times. The words change a little bit, but it basically goes like this. One. Dramatic recreation. Whatever it was that got me in trouble, Principal Nichols describes it in detail. Then you started eating the beans, making a huge mess. Then you spit out a mouthful of beans on the table, and then... Uh, yeah, I remember what happened. I was there. Two. Twisted sister. He compares me to Ellen. Your sister would never engage in such behavior. Nice. How would he like it if I compared him to other principals? Not that I know any, but there must be some better ones out there. Three. He uses the P word. You have so much potential. And this is news? Dude, I know I have potential. I'm just saving it for something more important than school. Take this slip to Mrs. Sherwicky at the end of the day. Reason for detention. Green bean incident. Green bean incident? That makes it sound like some sort of scandal. Uh, hello, Earth to Nichols, I was trying to set a world record. Not only that, his lecture dragged on past the fifth period bell. Now I'm late for Jim. Hey, Jim, that could be where I'll surpass all others. Maybe I'm supposed to dominate in rope climbing, or volleyball, or... Whatever Coach Calhoun has us doing today. Oop. Except Coach Calhoun isn't here. It's Coach John. Coach John was PS38's gym teacher back in the day. He retired, but the school keeps bringing him back as a sub. That might be fine for the school, but for us kids, it's a complete nightmare. Because Coach John is insane. Coach John fact. He enjoys showing everyone the scars from all his knee surgeries. And the bone was poking through the skin! Have you ever seen one of those war movies where the drill sergeant is a total psycho who's always screaming at everybody? Take away the uniform, and you've got Coach John. Run, maggots, run! I scoot around the bleachers, hoping to get into the locker room before he notices me. Not a chance. The man can't see his own feet, but somehow he spots me right away. Hey, you! Porcupine! Coach John's not real good with names. You're late, fella. Lateness is for losers. See how warm and friendly he is? Change up! Move it! Hup, 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 hup! I zip into the locker room. It's empty. That's a relief. Now I don't have to deal with Alan Ashworth and his towel of doom. Beware of the terry cloth! Snap! Ow! I jump into my shorts and t-shirt and head back to the gym when I spot myself in the mirror. I've still got dried green bean crud on my face. Nasty. I'll just give it a quick rinse. I lean over the sink. Rub, slosh, scrub. What the? Ah! Oh no! There was water on the countertop! It soaked right into my shorts! It looks like I wet my pants. I try to dry myself off with some paper towels, but it's no use. The spot's still there. This is a disaster. What am I going to do? I can't walk around like this. It's like carrying a huge sign that says, 
I had an accident. I look around frantically for another pair of shorts. Nothing in the lockers, nothing in the lost and found. Suddenly, I remember that Jenny's in my gym class. She'll think I'm a total idiot. Hey, Speedy! What are you doing, changing into a tuxedo? Coach John bellows. Get out here! Now! Gulp. Looks like I have no choice. But wait. There's a duffel bag tucked under a bench near the coach's room. And sticking out of it is... A pair of shorts! Yes! What luck! I peel off my wet shorts and grab the dry ones. I don't care whose they are. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what size they are. Extra, extra large. Okay, maybe I do care about the size thing. Holy cow! These are like clown clothes. They're not even close to fitting. Okay, kid, I'm gonna count to ten. Yikes. Coach John's getting ready to snap big time. I've got to find a way to make these shorts stay on and fast. One, two, three, four. Aha, there's a pile of towels by the showers. I grab a handful. Five, six, seven, and start stuffing them down the shorts. Eight, nine. Come on, come on, faster, go, hurry, go. I know, I look like a Dorcasaurus. But I found a way to keep these shorts up. And they don't have a giant wet spot on them. Waddle, 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 waddle. I hustle into the gym. The whole class is lined up in rows, stretching out. I hear a chuckle. Then another one. In five seconds, everybody's laughing like crazy. <laughs> Everybody but Coach John. Is this your idea of a joke, Junior? A joke? I have no idea what he means. But he looks like he's about to rip my arm off. I shake my head, afraid to say the wrong thing. He slowly raises his hand and points at my shorts. I look at him, still baffled. Then I see it. A white C.J. on Coach John's sweatpants. I'm starting to get a very bad feeling. I look down at my shorts, and there it is. The same white CJ. I'm wearing Coach John's shorts! Suddenly it hits me! Coach John thinks I'm making fun of him, that I'm showing off like I'm some sort of Coach John mini-me. Th this isn't what it looks like. I had to wear these shorts because I... <clears throat> It was an emergency, and they were so huge that I... They didn't fit, so I, I took some towels, and I... I can tell he's not hearing me. I can hardly hear myself. And all I can see is Coach John's giant face turning about eight different shades of purple. We'll see if you're still laughing, says Coach John. After you've run some gassers. Perfect. Just how I wanted to spend fifth period. Running wind sprints. In Coach John's shorts. With a stomach full of green beans. Oh. Chapter 10. Wham! Another pink slip. This is getting ridiculous. Coach John wrote me up, I say angrily. I guess making me run wind sprints wasn't enough for him. What's it say? No respect for teacher, I read aloud. That's messed up. What about him having no respect for me? He didn't even bother to write my name. He called me Kid with Weird Hair. <laughs> What's so funny? I snap. He's right, Francis says. You do have weird hair. It's boingy, pat, pat, pat. It's sproingy, pat, pat, pat. Great. Now, on top of everything else, my so-called best friends are treating my head like a giant slinky. This day is really starting to bum me out. Any more of this, I grumble, and today just might make my list of worst days ever. Worst Days Ever by Nate One my seventh birthday party. Buster Glick gave me a black eye during a game of Twister. 
Deirdre Randall threw up in the bobbing for apples tub. Three words, world's lamest magician. Pick a card, any card. Oh, wait, not that one. Two, middle school skating night. The entire sixth grade was there, including parents. Result, total humiliation. Wee! Hey Nate, love your dad's figure skates. <laughs> Three, spring fever dance. That was the night Jenny and Artur officially started going out. Meanwhile, I got stuck slow dancing with Kim Cressley. <sighs> oh, Artur! Stop stepping on my feet. <sighs> Four, sixth grade nature hike. I got yelled at by some crazy park ranger. Hey, kid, get out of that poison oak! I found out too late that the lock on the porta potty was broken. Ah! Oops! Excuse me, Nate. Hold it, Francis points out. You can't have a whole bunch of worst days ever. By definition, there can only be one worst anything. You mean like the world's worst noogie? Huh? Noogie, 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 noogie. Ow! Anyway, all I said was that today could make the list. It's not official yet. There's still a chance that this could turn into a great day, if this stupid fortune ever comes true. I think you're trying too hard, Teddy declares. What do you mean? I ask. The whole fortune thing. You're forcing it. Just let it happen. Relax. Go with the flow, Teddy says. Go with the flow. What is this? A yoga retreat? I'm not going to surpass all others by sitting around doing deep breathing exercises. In, out, in, out. Let's move it, guys," says Francis. "We've got math. Ugh, I hate math. I understand it fine, but my brain shuts down when Mr. Staples says stuff like, 'Math is all around us. You'll use math every day for the rest of your life.'" The rest of my life, I can't wait. We head into the math room. Right away, I can tell something's wrong. Mr. Staples isn't watering his plants or writing problems on the board. He's not chatting with students or telling them horrible knock-knock jokes. Knock-knock. Who's there? Woo! Woohoo! Don't get so excited. It's just a joke. <laughs> What's wrong with Mr. Staples? I whisper. He's just sitting there. Well, what's he supposed to be doing? Teddy asks, dancing on the desk. Teddy doesn't get it, but I do. I know trouble when I see it. Take your seats, everyone, Mr. Staples says. The classroom gets quiet. That's weird. Mr. Staples never tells us to take our seats. Suddenly, everyone else is noticing what I've already realized. Something bad is about to happen. Please put away your books and binders. He instructs us. I knew it. A pop quiz. You have thirty minutes, Mr. Staple says, passing out the quizzes. Please read the instructions careful. Blah 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 blah. While he babbles away, I quickly scan the quiz sheet. Only twelve questions. Hey, that's not too bad. I should be able to handle twelve questions in thirty minutes. Mr. Staples is done with whatever he was saying. He takes a look at the clock, and begin. Away I go. Look, I already told you I'm not crazy about math, but you don't have to like something to be good at it. I work my way down the page. Hmm, this one's easy, and so's that one, and that one, and that one. Holy cow! I am crushing these questions. This is a breeze. I finish the last problem, check my answers, and put down my pencil. Done. And check this out. I finished ten minutes early. I look around the room. Teddy's still working. Francis is still working. Everyone's still working. 
I'm the first one finished. My superior brain power has blown everybody else away. Hey, I've surpassed all others. The fortune has come true. Okay, I'll admit that surpassing all others on a math quiz isn't as exciting as setting a world record, but at this point, I'll take anything. I sneak a peek behind me. Even Gina's still working. Ha! I can't wait to see the look on her face when she realizes that I aced this quiz and she times up, everyone. Check your answers front and back, then pass them in. Yeah, hear that, everyone? Pass them in. Wait. Check your answers front and back? Did he say back? What? I flip my quiz over. My eyes feel like they're about to pop out of my skull. More questions on the back? There are! Eight more questions! Eight questions I didn't even see! Oh no! Everyone else is handing in their quizzes. In a total panic, I grab my pencil. I don't even know what I'm writing. I just start scribbling numbers at random. I'll take that, Nate. I flinch. Mr. Staples is standing at my desk. He grabs my paper. No! I can't pass it in with almost half of the questions blank. I pull the page away from him. Time's up, Nate. He growls, trying to take it from me. I hang on tight. All I need is a couple more minutes. But Mr. Staples wants my quiz now. He pulls on the sheet hard. Suddenly, I'm in a full-scale tug-of-war with my math teacher. Rip! And I just lost. Uh, <laughs> Got any tape? I'll trade you, Mr. Staple says through clenched teeth. He snatches the torn paper from my hand. You give me that, and I'll... Right, 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 right. Give you this. A pink slip. All I was trying to do was finish the stinking math quiz. Instead, here I am with another detention. Teachers always say they'll be happy if you just do your best, but when you try to do your best, they don't let you. Something about that just doesn't add up. Chapter 11 This stupid fortune, I complain, crumpling the paper into a tiny ball, has been nothing but trouble. But for the rest of us, it's been nonstop entertainment. <laughs> How would your face like to entertain my fist? I snap. Mate, the day's not over yet, says Francis. The fortune could still come true during science. Huh. Wake up, Rip Van Dorkel, I say. Nothing good ever happens in science. Not with Professor Chuckles running the show. Professor Chuckles, Teddy snickers. That's funny. Don't let Mr. Galvin hear you call him that. Francis says, he won't think it's funny. He never thinks anything's funny, I point out. He's stiff as a board. You could say that again, says Francis. People say he's never laughed. Ever. Maybe he had a sense of humor surgically removed. Hmm. Something just clicked. Guys, that's it. I say excitedly. The way for me to surpass all others. I'll do something nobody's ever done. I'll make Mr. Galvin laugh. Francis stares at me like he thinks I'm crazy. You're crazy, he says. Don't you remember when we looked at all those old yearbooks in the library? Sure I do. We were trying to find funny pictures of teachers, bad haircuts, goofy-looking clothes, stuff like that. We dug out a bunch of yearbooks going back 30 or 40 years. It was hilarious. <laughs> Look at Mrs. Godfrey. <laughs> she only had two chins back then. Mr. Galvin's been teaching at PS38 since the Jurassic period. Another one of my nicknames for him is G-Rex. So we found plenty of pictures of him. There were formal shots. Has Mr. Galvin ever been informal? Mr. Galvin. Science. There were candids. You can't call them action shots since he's such a fossil. 
Stand back, everyone. This bow tie is radioactive. There was even a photo of him from his hair replacement system phase. Nice plugs. <laughs> All the photos had one thing in common. Mr. Galvin wasn't smiling in any of them. If nobody's ever seen him smile, Francis says as we head for the science lab, how do you expect to make him laugh? Hey, if anybody can do it, I can, I say. I crack people up all the time. Yeah, but not on purpose. Teddy chuckles. Ring! The bell. That's my cue. Let the laughs begin. I decide to start with some good old-fashioned visual humor. There's nothing like a few strategically placed pencils. Hello! Yuck, 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 yuck. Take your seat. Nuts, I say as I reach my desk. No reaction. Here's a reaction, Teddy says. I'll never, ever borrow a pencil from you again. I'm just warming up, I say. Watch this. I'm going to plan B. Please open your textbooks to page... Mr. Galvin starts to say. I raise my hand. Mr. Galvin, I have a science question for you, I say. How can you tell a male chromosome from a female chromosome? You pull down its genes. Wait, was that a hint of a smile? Did he start to laugh for just a half a second? Sit down. Guess not. Mr. Comedy, Francis whispers. You're bombing. Butt out, I hiss back. I still haven't hit him with my best material. I pull a page from my notebook. It's a Dr. Cesspool comic I've been working on, and it's almost done. I whip out my drawing pen and put the finishing touches on the last panel. This is guaranteed to crack him up. Mr. G, I say approaching his desk, I have something to show you. He doesn't look up. Does it have anything to do with science? Absolutely, I answer. I hand him the comic. The main character is a doctor. The Wacky Adventures of Dr. Cesspool. Read on. Episode 17. One Day in the Operating Room. Doctor, I'm a little nervous. Now, now, you're in good hands. I'm a brilliant surgeon. Well, maybe not brilliant, but I'm pretty good. I could perform this surgery with my eyes closed. Nurse, my blindfold. Blindfold? No, hands me that sharp thingy. The End by Nate Wright, Comic Genius. He doesn't laugh. Pretty much the opposite, actually. You're wasting my time, young man, he says. I'll keep this paper and that pen. Pluck! We only use pencils in this class. He jams my pen, my special drawing pen, into his shirt pocket. Rats! I'll never see that again. I trudge back to my seat. You're striking out, champ, Teddy whispers. You're just not tickling his funny bone. Tickling? Tickling! It's worth a try. It's not like anything else is working. There's a feather duster over by the supplies cabinet. Mr. Galvin uses it to keep the test tubes and beakers clean. Easy now. Gotta be casual about this. I'll just ease up behind him and... Ticky, 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 tick. What on earth are you doing? I was... I was just... Uh... I start. Quiet! He roars. Just go to your desk and stay there. And if I hear another peep out of you, I'll put you in detention for a week. What choice do I have? I shuffle to my desk, flop down into my chair, and stare straight ahead at a tiny little dot on Mr. Galvin's shirt. The dot gets bigger, and bigger, and bigger. <gasps> My pen! The cat must have come off inside his pocket. And here's the funny part. He hasn't even noticed. <laughs>
<laughs> yes, he has. He stares me down. Do you find this amusing, Nate? I know I should say no, or at least try to keep a straight face. But something about that Mondo ink stain on Mr. Galvin's shirt is just... Well... Hilarious! <laughs> oh, I try to hold it in, I really do, but I can't! Oh, 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 oh. By the time I pull myself together, Mr. Galvin is handing me a pink slip for five hours of detention. <sighs> Maybe someday I'll look back on this and laugh. Chapter 12 it's 2.59. School's over in exactly one minute. On a normal day, I'd be Mr. Happy right about now. I'd be counting down the seconds, ready to jump out of my seat, making plans about how to spend the rest of the afternoon. Playing Godfrey. It's just like horse, but it's way worse when you lose. Clang! Ugh! Ha! That's why! or dropping by Classy Comics to buy the latest issue of Femme Fatality. Best superheroine ever. You love that one. It starts on the frozen planet of Gamma X3. Don't ruin it! But there hasn't been anything normal about today since... since... Hmm. Guess the bell must have rung. Everybody's leaving. As in leaving the building. Going home. And I'm not just talking about kids. So long, Nate. Have a nice day. Have a nice day? Is he serious? First of all, the day's over. Second, he already knows I'm not having a nice day, since he's one of the people who started this whole detention convention. Teachers are such dope sometimes. And by sometimes, I mean always. The place empties out in no time. And before I know it, it's just me. There's nothing more sickening than being stuck in school when classes are over. Try it sometime. It feels totally wrong. You can almost hear the walls talking trash. Hey, genius! Everyone else is already gone. But you're still here. What a loser! Shut up, walls. No sense putting it off. I head for the detention room. I admit I've had my share of detentions. I'm there so much, Teddy even made up a joke about it. How do you get to the detention room? Follow Nate! <laughs> I didn't say it was a good joke. My last detention was the day of the chess club bake sale. Dramatic flashback. Francis and I were running the table. We were making some pretty good money, mostly from selling Francis's mom's lemon squares, which are awesome. Note, nobody was touching Dad's coconut yogurt pie. It was crowded. I noticed a kid named Randy Betancourt taking one of the lemon squares, real casual-like and palming it in his hand. He didn't pay. He just started walking away. Hey, pay up! Me? He acted all innocent. Pay up for what? He said. For that lemon square behind your back. Lemon square? What lemon square? Zing! He chucked the lemon square away and... Sploop, it hit Mrs. Godfrey! Nobody had noticed me and Randy arguing, but everybody stopped and looked when that lemon square smacked into Mrs. Godfrey's butt. Who did that? Who threw that food? Nate did. And of course she believed him. Shocker. Did she even ask for my side of the story? I don't need to hear your side of the story. I'm a teacher. Onion breath. Ugh. She pulled out her little pink pad and started writing me up. Randy stood beside her, giving me one of those You got in trouble and I didn't looks. That's when I heard the voice inside my head. Get your money's worth. I was already getting detention, right? Might as well get punished for doing something than for doing nothing. So I did something. Dad's coconut yogurt pie.
<laughs> I ended up with five detentions that day, but I made sure Randy got what he deserved. That's what bugs me about all the detentions I got today. I didn't get my money's worth. I walk in. Some days there are other kids. But today it's just me and Mrs. Zerwicky. Mrs. Zerwicky fact. During detention, she passes the time by reading cheesy romance novels with titles like Flames of Longing and Pounding Surf. Oh my. She puts down her book. Again, Nate? She asks with a sigh. I just shrug. Hmm, let's see your detention slip. Did you hear that? Slip. Singular. The old gal's pacemaker is about to get a major jolt. There's, uh, more than one, actually, I say, fishing in my pocket. Mrs. Zerwicky raises an eyebrow. How many more, she says. I lay a wad of pink papers on her desk. It looks like a mutant origami. Sweet sticky molasses. Nate, she asks. Just how many teachers wrote you up? All of them, I say. Plus the principal. Mrs. Sir Wicky looks a little stunned. She spreads out the slips on her desk like she's playing solitaire. She shakes her head. Nate, you appear to have established a new record. Record? I repeat. What kind of record? Over the years, several students have received four detentions in a single day. A few have had five. One even got six. But nobody has ever received seven detention slips in one day. Until now. Wait. Does that mean I've... surpassed all others? Mrs. Sir Wicky grimaces. Well, I suppose you could put it that way. Yes! It came true! I shout. True, true, true. Ooh, 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 ooh. It came true! Mrs. Sir Wicky looks totally confused, which is nothing new. She takes off her glasses, rubs her eyes, and says, Please sit down, Nate. Sit down? Gladly! I practically dance over to my desk. On the desktop, there's a drawing I made the last time I was here. You're not supposed to draw on the desks, but what do they expect us to do during detention? Just sit here? Hey, I never signed this. I sneak a glance to make sure Mrs. Zerwicky's not looking. Then I pull out a pencil and write at the bottom, By Nate Wright. School record holder. School record holder. Now that's greatness. Okay, so it's not going to get me one of those display case trophies. But hey, a record's a record. I'm officially a part of PS38 history. When you think about it, getting all those detentions turned out to be pretty lucky. I can hardly believe my good fortune.